Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Skelton and I am the pastor at Dogwood Prayer United Methodist Church as well as Seated Chapel United Methodist Church in Oblong, Illinois and it's a blessing and an honor to be able to share the Word of God with you wherever you are and whatever you may be doing. As I often state at the beginning of my message recordings, it's this, that the Word of God is not meant just to be embodied, experienced, and felt and embraced on a Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, or Sunday evening. No, rather the Word of God is meant to be embodied, embraced, and felt and experienced every day of the week. That it's that Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and even beyond that, the Word of God is meant to be embraced, experienced, and embodied, and felt not only every day of the week, but every week of the month, every month of the year, and every year of your life. The Word of God is not just meant for one specific day, it's meant for every day of your life. So wherever you are and whatever you may be doing, I pray that the words that God has laid on my heart to share with you impact your life in some special way that invites you to be a better disciple today than you were yesterday. So wherever you are and whatever you may be doing, I pray that the Word of God finds your heart. And with that being said, I want to thank you for taking the time to join me, whether you're, you're tuning in the day this message is, is uploaded or it's several days later or several weeks later, it doesn't matter. All that, all that matters is that God has led you to this message for a specific reason. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time to join me as I share with you the words of God that that the words of God in which he has laid on my heart. And today we're going to continue our sermon series titled Profit Margins. And we're going to be looking at a, a rather famous, but not so famous, infamous prophet named Amos, who is in the, the Old Testament, tucked towards the end of the Old Testament. And Amos has something for us to think about. And, and it comes through God's question of, what do you see? So we're going to reflect on that. We're going to read about that today. And we're going to continue our sermon series, Prophet Margins. So again, I thank you for tuning in and allowing the Word of God to impact your life in a special way that makes you a better disciple today than what you were yesterday. So thank you for joining me as we partake in the next step of our journey as we look at prophets on the margin. Today we're going to turn to Amos chapter 7 and we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 14, I believe. I'm sorry, 7 through 15. So Amos chapter 7, verses 7 through 15. So please read with me or just listen to me as we embark on the words of Amos, a prophet who is on the margin. Verse 7. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman, a dresser of sycamore trees. 
And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of God for the people of God, and all God's people said, Thanks be to God. A snake goes in to see the optometrist because his eyesight is failing. It's actually affecting my life. I, I can't hunt anymore because I can't see, hissed the snake. The doctor fits the snake for glasses and the snake immediately, immediately notices an improvement, improvement in his eyesight. A week later, the doctor calls the snake to check how the glasses are holding up. They're fine, the snake answers, but, but now I'm being treated for depression. Depression? The doctor asks. Yeah, my eyesight cleared up, but it made me realize I've been dating a garden hose. You might have heard that Benjamin Franklin invented eyeglasses. Especially if you have seen the movie National Treasure starring Nicolas Cage from 2004. But it's clear they, the glasses, had already been around for some 400 years by the 1700s when Ben Franklin was living. The earliest depiction of glasses in a work of art appears in 1352 CE, uh, in a 1352 CE Treviso Cathedral fresco painting by Tommaso de Medina. Therefore, if eyeglasses were drawn in a fresco painting in 1325 CE, then they must have been around before Benjamin Franklin. As a matter of fact, according, uh, according to historical documents, eyeglasses were invented by Salvino de Armadi in Italy during the late 200s and early 300s. Although giving Benjamin Franklin the credit of inventing eyeglasses has dwindled, nonetheless, Franklin is, Franklin is credited for inventing bifocals in the mid-1700s. He split one lens in half with the upper part being made for distance viewing and the lower part for near viewing. Franklin wrote to London philanthropist George Watley in May 1785. As I wear my own glasses constantly, I have only to move my eyes up or down as I want to see distinctly far or near, the proper glasses being always ready. Glasses have changed the world. Last week we encountered the prophet Elijah who took the place of Elijah after he was taken up to heaven. As they continued walking and talking, as the text says, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two men, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. We encountered Elijah as he was instructing through a messenger, the great and mighty commander of King Aram's army, Naaman to immerse himself in the Jordan River so that he would be washed and be made clean, so that his leprosy and other illnesses would be washed away. Naaman was instructed to visit Elisha by a refugee girl that he captured and made his wife's servant. After displaying rage, in frustration toward Elisha for not being physically present to cure him of this incurable disease, Naaman's servants convinced Naaman to do as the prophet suggested. As the text read, so he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan. According to the word of the man of God, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy and he was made clean. Naaman's journey toward restoration and healing began and was motivated by the voices of those weaker than him, less fortunate than him, and less powerful than him. Essentially, Naaman's life was changed by the voices of those on the margins, those we don't really take the time to listen to. Who did you listen to this past week? If Elisha wants us to listen, Amos wants us to look, to put on the glasses of God. 
He wants us to see what God needs us to see. God asks Amos, what do you see? And in that same verse, Amos simply responds, a plumb line. Now, I was reading this text. I, the word plumb line confused me. I have no idea what a plumb line is. So I looked it up and I asked myself, what is a plumb line? A plumb line is a device used for determining the true vertical line of a structure. Essentially, a plumb line is what we would call a modern day level. God is calling Amos to check the vertical line of Israel, to check how level or straight the line from earth to heaven is for the people of Israel. Remember, the people of Israel have, have wavered from their faith a time or two. They, they made a golden calf and worshipped idols. God needs Amos to see what is really taking place. What is really happening on earth? The plumb line is no longer vertical. It's starting to waver to fray. So he asks Amos, what do you see? Nevertheless, what God is asking Amos is what he asks us on a daily basis. What do we see? What do you see around you? God is calling Amos and us to check our vertical faith as we look harder and deeper for the work of God. We have to interpret as we see and understand as we look. Let us pray. God of prophets, you call all of us to be prophets. You may clear the path of goodness and righteousness. You set a plumb line for us to follow. May we follow that plumb line. May my words fall to the ground as your words settle in the hearts of all those before me. In your name we pray. Amen. According uh, to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, approximately 12 million people, 40 years and over, in the United States alone have vision impairment, including 1 million who are blind, 3 million who have vision impairment after correction, and 8 million who have vision impairment due to uncorrected refractive error. Furthermore, it has been reported by blogeyeglasses.com that by the year 2050, half of the human population will need glasses. That's just 28 years from now. This projection comes from the increased time that we are spending looking at a digital screen. It has also been documented that 64% of those needing vision correction wear glasses and only 11% of those needing vision correction wear contact lenses. I wear both. Uh, I mostly wear glasses uh, when I work outside and do random projects. Um, I wear contacts, but I wear both. But again, 64% wear glasses and only 11% wear contacts. And lastly, approximately 58% of women wear glasses and approximately 42% of males wear glasses. Ultimately, where would this world be today if glasses had not been invented? I ask myself today, where would I be if, if glasses or contacts wouldn't have been invented? Maybe you yourself wear glasses or contacts, so I ask you the question, where would you be if you were unable to get glasses or contacts in your life? What would you be able to see? In our text today, we encounter yet another prophet who is on the margins, who is often neglected and seen as someone insignificant compared to the prophets of Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, to name a few. The prophet Amos isn't a mighty warrior or even someone who had a prominent or eminent presence within his community. But yet, God chose Amos to see what only God could see. God chose someone insignificant to do something extraordinary. God chose someone who needed assistance, quite possibly God glasses, to save a people. 
Our text today ends with a description of the less known prophet responding to Amaziah, an official priest of the royal shrine of Bethel, Amos of Tekoa, a small village in Judah, noted, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees, and the Lord took me from following the flock. Amos is a simple herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees, one, someone who, who gashed the fruit of a tree with a knife to induce ripening. Not a profound profession. He isn't a well-known warrior or a highly respected priest. He isn't an elder of his community, and he probably isn't even on any committee. Amos is on the margin, set aside, doing his own thing, not really paid attention to. But God chose him to prophesy to the people. Amos was just like you and me, an everyday person with God-given actions. So being called to engage in prophetic ministry was certainly something he didn't predict for his own life. Amos saw a vision for his own life, but God saw something different. Have any of you ever had a vision of your own life, but then had that vision changed? Have any of you pursued one career and then realized that that career wasn't for you? Have any of you ever experienced a drastic change in your life that you never expected? Amos is just like you and me. Having a plan, but having that plan disrupted. After being called and told to prophesy to, prophesy to the people, Amos was a little bit confused. Why did God choose me and what does God see in me that I don't see in myself? Are questions that Amos and you probably ask yourself on a daily basis when God is calling you to do something. But the question becomes, how do you respond? Amos is immediately thrown into a character assassination by a corrupt priest, Amaziah. Amaziah was a priest from the house of Bethel, a house known for idolatrous worship. This priest did what many corrupt troublemakers do. He, he spread rumors, rumors that led to the destruction of people. Amaziah reports to the king of Israel during this time, Jeroboam. Amos has conspired against you. And in the very center of the house of Israel, the land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword. And Israel must go into exile from this land. Amaziah sees Amos as a threat. But God sees Amos as a source of hope and new beginnings for the people of Israel. To this rumor, Amaziah responds to Amos, O oh, seer, go flee to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and, and, prophecy, and prophesy there, but never again, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it's the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. Amaziah is warning Amos to leave, and if he doesn't leave, there will, there will be consequences that Amos won't be able to es escape from. Additionally, Amaziah is, is downplaying the decision of God and choosing Amos to become a prophet. Go, flee away to the land of Judah where you are from, and continue to earn bread by being insignificant and worthless is what Amaziah is telling Amos. Go back to your original life. Don't disrupt us anymore. We don't believe in these kinds of things. What you see is false. But returning home is not what Amos has been called to do. Amos has been called to see what God needs him to see in order to save the people of Israel and beyond. Therefore, Amos makes a bold move. He goes to the actual temple at Bethel, 
which is no longer pure and holy nor tried and true, and tells the people there that God was setting a plumb line. Remember, God asks Amos, what do you see? And Amos responded by saying, I see a plumb line. A plumb line, again, was a string with a weight at the end of it to measure how straight a wall was. Amos informed the idol worshipers and their priests that God was setting a plumb line against the house of Jeroboam and that the king Israel and its leadership were likely crooked next to the plumb line. Their faith was no longer in line with God's vision for his people. Their vertical line of faith was knotted. Uh, kinked, loose, and quite possibly frayed. Because of their wavering and crooked faith, God says this to Amos, See, I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. God is frustrated. God is upset. God is going to destroy the house of Jeroboam with a sword. God is essentially reliving his words from Amos chapter 5 when he laments over Israel's sins. I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I, I will not accept them and the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs, and I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But through Amos, by giving him the ability to see what God needs him to see, God is going to let justice roll down like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The question of what do you see is asking something more than what may be seen on the surface. It is a question that is asking all of us to see what God sees and to understand what we see. It's a question of faith. Amos a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees, someone on the margins, is chosen by God to see something extraordinary, a plumb line of faith. I would suspect that Amos, after being called upon by God, recited these words from the psalmist. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are humans that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Amos realized that there is more to life than meets the eye, that God has his fingers in everything. As a matter of fact, God is and part of everything that we know and could possibly ever know. God is, is Amos's plumb line. His faith, his creation, his devotion, and his love towards the one who has called him to do great things for all people. Amos saw what we need to see today that our faith needs to be straightened. When I think about this text, I am reminded of the, of the pictures that my nephews and nieces often draw for me. There's one in my Bible, actually. And, and when they draw things, especially at an early age, they, um, I'll just be honest, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is that they're handing me. There's scribbles everywhere. There's blue, there's purple, there's greens, there's whites, there's blacks. There's every color you can think of under the rainbow, and it's all compiled into this big array of something. When they hand that to me, I don't see what they see. But when they hand me that piece of paper, they give it to me with a story. They say, Uncle Daniel, this is, this is about my family and my house, we're, out in the, we're outside playing something. I don't see that, but they see that. And when I take the time to listen to them and to, and to hear their words and just imagine with them and to see what they see, I begin to see what they've created. My faith in them grows deeper. God needs us to see between the scribbles and the unknown to vision what he wants us to see in this world. 
He wants us to straighten our faith so that we do see beyond the scribbles. We do see beyond our mistakes. When you look out your front door, what do you see? Do you see flowers blooming, vehicles and tractors going by, the corn blowing in the breeze, birds flying in the air, people walking on sidewalks? What do you see when you look out your front door? When I look outside, I see God's creation at work, bringing us the reminder that He is always present in our lives, helping us see the beauty in all things. What do you see when you open the doors of your church? Do you see people smiling, enjoying a time of fellowship, worshiping God? Do you see cars in the parking lot? Do you see people driving by and not stopping? Do you see empty pews or chairs? When I look at the churches that I'm in charge of, I see hope, potential, committed followers of Christ who are willing to do His work, a space, a place where people are welcomed to worship God. And I do not see empty pews or chairs, but opportunities for growth, for invitation, for new spirits of faith. What do you see when you look out into the world? Do you see love, justice, hope, and faith? Do you see war, famine, destruction, death, and tears impacting the dry pavement and concerned and worried looks? When I look out into this world, I see all these things. Not only do I see these things, but, but I hear them as well. This world is broken, but it has a foundation of love. This world is hurting, but there is peace that surpasses all understanding, waiting to bring comfort. This world is experiencing war, destruction, famine, defeat, but there is hope for a better tomorrow. And this world is filled with death, worry, and impactful tears that could flood this, this world. But it is also filled with encouragement, greener pastures, and people who are here to wipe away every tear that falls. What do you see? Do you see a plumb line that reveals a strong and level faith that connects this earth to the heavens? I do see a vertical faith that connects us to the heavens, to God's glorious kingdom, but I also see a horizontal plumb line that embraces all of us with unending love, amazing grace, and eternal salvation. What do you see? The question that God asks Amos is also a question that Jesus alludes to in the New Testament when he invites Simon to cast his net to the other side of the boat. Simon, also called Peter, couldn't see the fish that Jesus saw in the water. But yet through his faith, Simon did as Jesus said. When they, Simon and the other disciples, had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to burst. The same principle applied when Jesus chose the 12 disciples. The 12 disciples who came from various backgrounds and occupations didn't see what Jesus saw in them. But through their faith, they decided to follow Jesus. We don't always see what God or Jesus needs us to see in ourselves, in others, in our church, in our community, or even in this world. But if we put our trust in Him, then our faith will always be flush against any plumb line. If Elisha wants us to listen, Amos wants us to look. Now it's true that God didn't ask Amos to take a stroll around his neighborhood and report what he saw. No, there was a specific vision that God had for Amos. God did something, set up something, and asked Amos to see, to see it and interpret it. So, our seeing is a deeper seeing. It goes below the surface. Where have you seen the handiwork of God in your life? We have to look harder and look deeper. We have to interpret as we see and understand as we look. 
God's repeated word to Amos was, what do you see? It was an invitation to pay attention, to take off the rose-colored glasses and really see what was before him. How often do we really pay attention to the world around us? Whether we are going to work or to school, whether we are running our errands or even trying to get some exercise in, do we really look around to see the state of the world, our nation or our neighborhood? What do you see? What is God calling you to do about the things that you do see in your life? Remember, Amos was just a normal person going about his daily life, but God still chose him to see what he sees. You never know. God could be calling you right now to see what he sees. How are you going to respond and what are you going to say when he asks, what do you see? Are you wearing God glasses? How does your faith measure up to a plumb line? What do you see? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to see what, need, what you need us to see. Help us to answer when you call upon us. Help us to hear those who are on the margins. Lord, we are here to do your will and save your people. All power and glory is yours now and forever. Amen. If there is a sermon takeaway I could offer you, it's this. If God gave you a piece of artwork that was simply just scribbles and asked you, what do you see? What would you respond? God, through Amos, through a prophet on the margins who was a simple herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees, was called, was chosen to do something that was unthinkable. He was called to see what God needs us to see. He set a plumb line against the people of Israel and noticed that their faith was wavering, it was crooked, it was, it was knotted, it was kinked, it was frayed, it was loose. So God sent Amos to do the work. How does your faith measure up to a plumb line if God were to put one in your life? If God called you today and asked, what do you see, what would you respond? What do you see when you open the front door, when you look out of your church, when you look into this world or even your neighborhood, what do you see? Even someone, even a prophet on the margins can see what God needs him to see. That's an invite to us. That's an invite to you that we have that same ability as long as we're willing to put on God's glasses. What do you see? is the main question from this sermon, from this message. It's a question, but it's also an invitation to seek an answer, to fill a need, to take care of those around you, and to notice and to pay attention to what God needs you to see. What do you So I ask you again, what do you see when you look out your front door? What do you see when you open the doors of, this, of your church? What do you see in the world? If God were to lay a plumb line against your faith, what would he see? May God bless your faith, help you see what he needs you to see. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go transforming lives as you live well and wisely in God's world. Amen. 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 May God bless each and every one of you, and may his love and light shine down upon you as you become the disciple that he needs you to be. Until we meet again, may God bless you, and may your faith be vertically straight and horizontally straight. Amen.